Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com slash contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. What is your take on the idea that the key to getting along with people and possibly making good friends eventually without sacrificing any of your integrity is to judge people in specific contexts and never beyond them. For instance, you judge your barber's value strictly by his work and not his philosophical views. Well, I don't think your phrasing of this question is precise, so let me reframe it so that I'm answering the question I think you're actually asking. The issue of judging people per se obviously must be done with a specific standard in mind. If you're judging somebody's ability to cut hair, then it doesn't matter if he's Hitler or Stalin or whoever, because what you're judging is his ability as a barber. So your question is really what constitutes a moral sanction. It's not precisely should I judge Hitler as a good barber, given his evil, it's should I deal with Hitler if all I'm interested in is a haircut? Well, let's examine these scenarios you are likely to face. The first scenario is the commonest. You transact with a barber and never find out anything about what he thinks about anything really important. This is how you transact with most people, in the business realm, not the personal realm. Now, the principle here is that it is not your responsibility to interrogate everyone you do business with in order to make sure that they don't believe anything bad. So under normal circumstances, the only thing you should be judging your barber on is how he cuts hair. But let's take a different scenario. Let's say he has posters of the hammer and sickle up on his windows, and so he's using his business to promote communism. In that case, assuming you have options, I would go somewhere else. As I said, it's not your responsibility to interrogate everyone you deal with to discover whether or not they support communism, but if he brings it up, then it's relevant. Especially if he's using the business you're patronizing as a means of spreading this evil idea. But now let's take the trickiest case. What if, as your barber is cutting your hair, and you're engaged in small talk, he lets out that he supports the minimum wage? Well then what, are you sanctioning that idea if you continue to go there? Should you leave? I think it's optional. There are such things as options, you know. Now if there's a barbershop right next door, then all things equal, I would go there. Although I wouldn't say that's necessary or mandatory. Even just on the basis that you have a good relationship with your current barber. The minimum wage is different from communism, though. Let's say it comes out that he supports communism. But he's not putting posters up in his windows. Well, then I'd be even more likely to go somewhere else. Although even then, I wouldn't say it's mandatory. I don't know what the principle governing these borderline cases is. I suppose the principle I implicitly act on is whether I find it sufficiently emotionally discomforting to be around someone whose ideas I know are evil, and of course the more evil or more dishonest they are, the worse. Now I don't mean this in a emotionalist way. I don't mean I would no longer patronize that barber just because I don't feel like it in the sense of using feelings as cognitive tools, but in the sense that I recognize that the mind has an identity, and that ignoring this person's support of communism may come at the cost of evading. Maybe that's optional, maybe some people can put that out of their minds easier than others, maybe there's a right or wrong answer there, I'm not sure, but I would think, can I rationally ignore this, or... If I'm acting in a basically rational way, will I be incapable of ignoring this, and will it therefore cause me displeasure, which would justify my going somewhere else? Because the displeasure is based on a rational assessment of communism. 
But that's a tricky case. It may be optional. It may be more peculiar to the person involved in the scenario than either of the other two situations I described. The principle of not having to investigate every view of someone you're dealing with and of not supporting a business that is promoting some idea you know is evil applies to everyone in a much wider context. But for these borderline cases, I operate on whether I think I can rationally ignore it or whether I don't want to dull my sensitivity to those kinds of ideas. Next question. How are rights inalienable if we can justly imprison people for violating others' rights? Inalienability doesn't mean that a right can't be violated. It means that violating a right has certain unavoidable consequences. Think about the moral issue of whether you're going to maintain your diet. You can eat this piece of cake. Or you can stay on your diet. Eating the cake will make you unhealthy and be bad for you. Staying on your diet will be good for you. Now, you don't have to avoid eating that piece of cake. It's possible for you to eat it, but it isn't possible to avoid the consequences of eating it. And that is the equivalent of inalienability here. So it's not that people can't violate your rights. It's that rights identify what you owe other people if you and they are to live and be happy, and what you owe them is not to inhibit their freedom. So somebody could break down my door and come steal my TV while I'm gone. He can violate my rights in that way, but he can't change the nature of reality. He can't change cause and effect. He can't change what consequences will result from his stealing my TV, which will be bad for me and also for him. Now, as for why it's okay to imprison people, the question is, where do rights come from? Why did those people have rights in the first place? Now, rights are not these things floating out there that exist intrinsically. They are relational. They are ultimately selfish. People have rights from your perspective. This is why animals don't have rights and people do. There's not some magical essence floating around in people that gives them rights. There's a relationship involved. And your relationship as a rational being to other rational beings is such that you have to respect their rationality for your own good. And it is that fact that individual rights identifies. I can't violate this person's rights if I expect not to have my own violated. And it also benefits me to leave this person free, rather than to have him as my slave. That's not true of animals. An animal is more valuable to you as a slave, and there's no question of, well, if I leave that animal free, he's not going to violate my rights. That animal is going to use force against you if it's going to use force against you. They don't have free will. They just do what they do. And they don't use reason. They just act. They go on their feelings. That's it. So you could think of it in the following terms. A human being loses his rights when he begins acting like an animal. And then he no longer has rights for exactly the reason animals don't have rights. There's no longer a question of having your own rights protected, logically requiring your respecting his rights because he's violating your rights. So that issue's out the window. And then, of course, there's no question of his being more valuable to you as a free person because he's not more valuable to you as a free person if he's going around violating people's rights. So that is why it is okay to put people in prison and why it isn't a violation of that person's rights. Rights are relational. Someone has rights because of how he relates to you and how his freedom of action relates to you. When his freedom of action is no longer in your self-interest, then he no longer has rights from your perspective. Next question. I've heard you say multiple times that you should hate your enemies. Is this consistent with objectivism? I'm currently reading The Fountainhead, and it seems like Rand is saying that you should not hate anyone. Obviously, there's the part when Rourke says he thinks nothing of Tui, but later on, Rand makes it clear that Rourke hates no one when she says that Rourke doesn't hate Wynand, but that Wynand is the closest Rourke has ever come to hating someone. 
I also understand through introspection that when I am at my happiest, I have no room for hate within me. I simply feel nothing towards all the evil men in the world. I believe I'm misunderstanding either you or Rand, as an oversight like this is uncharacteristic of someone as thoughtful as you. Where am I going wrong? Well, the first place you're going wrong is in your approach to consuming art. The Fountainhead is not a documentary. The Fountainhead is a novel with a theme and characters who express that theme. And the theme of The Fountainhead is independence. Now, hate is the emotion you feel toward someone who is threatening or has destroyed serious values of yours. Given the theme of The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand is obviously not going to showcase this emotion, or more precisely, circumstances in which this emotion would be legitimate. The point of the novel is to show Rourke's invulnerability to evil as the essence of a rational person's relationship to evil. Now, that doesn't mean there is never a time in a person's life where his serious values are threatened, and he should feel hate toward the people threatening them. But that is a minor, unusual occurrence in someone's life. Art is selective. It presents what's important. That Rourke is never in a position to hate in the novel isn't Ayn Rand saying that you should never hate. It's that hate is a minor issue in life. It's not important. So she's not going to put Rourke in circumstances where he has a bunch of people to hate because that would undercut the point of the novel, which is that the essence of Rourke's life is invulnerability to evil. They can't touch him. That doesn't mean it's literally impossible for someone like Howard Rourke to be in a situation where he would rationally hate someone. If somebody had murdered Dominique, Rourke would hate that person. But Ayn Rand didn't put that in the novel because that's not important. It's not usual. It's not what you should expect out of life. She has Rourke not hating anyone and points out that he doesn't hate anyone for exactly the same reason that she doesn't have a gust of wind come along and blow Rourke off the top of the skyscraper at the end of the novel. Now, that's not impossible. It could happen in real life, but that's not what's important. It's not what's usual. So it's not worth focusing on. Art is about what do you think life is essentially? What can you rationally expect your life to be like? And so if you are a sane person, you're not going to have your main character killed by a rock that falls out of the sky at random. Now that could happen, but you don't go around every day thinking that that might happen if you're a rational person. And so you're not going to put that in a novel and thereby make the statement that that's an important thing you should be thinking about every day. Now, if your view is that the universe is incoherent and unpredictable, then you could put something like that in there because that expresses your view that anything can happen at any time and there's no way to predict anything and your values are always at risk. But that is not Ayn Rand's view of how things normally go. So no, Ayn Rand was not against hate. She was against the idea that hate should be a major component of your life. For instance, one aspect of the Count of Monte Cristo that Ayn Rand didn't like was that revenge consumes the protagonist's life. She would agree with the idea that the best revenge is living well. Don't be consumed by your enemies. Don't spend the rest of your life tracking down evil to punish instead of pursuing your own values. That is ultimately second-handed. In Atlas Shrugged, John Galt says, never think of pain or danger or enemies a moment longer than is necessary to fight them. That doesn't mean never think of them, and therefore never hate anyone. It means don't linger on them. Don't think of them more than is absolutely necessary, because that's not what's important about life. What's important about life is your positive values, not destroying evil. Now, if you have to destroy evil at some point, hate is appropriate, but it shouldn't consume your life, and that's why she has Howard Rourke have the relationship to hate that he does. 
He doesn't feel it at all because he is a stylized representation of independence. So putting him in a situation where he felt hate, even if it was rational hate, would be her saying that that's an important part of life, and it isn't. Now, you say you simply feel nothing towards all the evil men in the world. Well, if that's because you never think of the evil men in the world, that's good. Assuming you don't have any reason to think of them because they're not an imminent threat to your values in a personal way. But if you mean you feel nothing when you do think of them, that is very bad. That is not the kind of enlightenment Ayn Rand intended. When you think of evil men, you should feel hate. You just shouldn't think of them. Unless you absolutely have to, and then only so long as it takes to defend your positive values. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening.